All right, welcome to this third in the series of, uh, of seminars. Um, the title has been Land, um, Communities and the Ecological Crisis. Um, and we're looking at, today, we're actually looking at the impact of mining on some of these issues to do with communities and the ecological crisis. So some of you will have heard about us, the people's land policy, but I'll say a few words because we've got quite a few different people this time. Um, we grew out of a conference that was held about three years ago, maybe even four coming up in November, called Land for What? And our concern is really the need for land reform in particularly in England, but also really we're interested in working with people all over the UK. And the reason that we think this is important is because all the struggles we're involved in have to do with land, whether it be housing, whether it be community space, whether it be the environment, whether it be food, everything has to do with land. And the system that we live in at the moment is that the land is owned and controlled by a very small minority. And uh, the rest of us have really very little say and how this land is used. So that's sort of our aim. And we've been working with a number of groups, housing groups, uh, food groups, environmental groups for several years now. Eventually, the idea is to have some kind of land reform bill, similar to in Scotland, where we can actually start making some, some major changes. Obviously, these kind of changes depend on also building a mass movement because change doesn't happen because a few politicians decide that they're going to be nice. Um, change only comes when you've got enough people who are really pushing for change. And uh, this is what work we feel we're part of this. Uh, obviously not the leaders of such a movement, but we hope to be part of building uh, such a movement. So um, tonight then, so I'll move on because we are co-hosting this tonight with the London Mining Network. And uh, Karima from the London Mining Network is going to say a few things about the London Mining Network. Well, first of all, thank you, Bonnie. Thank you very much for inviting us to be part of this uh, uh, series of seminars that you've been organising. Um, I'm just, uh, just going to spend less than a minute saying what, something about the London Mining Network so that we can then move on to the speakers. Um, so London Mining Network is a network of organisations who work in solidarity with communities around the world who have been, who are harmed by or threatened with harm by the actions of mining companies. Um, that is threatened through threats to their rights as people, their land rights, their environment, their environment, their livelihoods, um, all of those things. Um, the the companies that we particularly focus on are those that are listed on the London Stock Exchange, hence we're called the London Mining Network. And we, as well as having a formal network, we also work informally with a large network of people. So sometimes our networks change a little as well as working with the people that are always there. Um, so today, three of our member groups um, are all part of the London Mining Network, but also representing organizations in their own right. Um, are speaking. That will be um, uh, Isabel Tarr from Coal Action Network, uh, Hal Rhodes from Yes to Life, No to Mining, which is part of the Gaia, um, uh, the Gaia Foundation, and uh, Seb Ordenez from uh, War on Want. Um, so I'm going to hand you back to Bonnie now and um, come back to you later maybe to say a bit more or to answer questions. Bonnie, you're muted. I know, I know. I was just getting sorry, sorry that. All right. So, uh, was it Seb? You were going to begin, weren't you? You were going to start us off. The so Seb from the War War is going to start the, uh, the thank you presentation. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to 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 be here to participate with you all to exchange and learn from you as well um i think what i'm going to try and do in about 10 minutes is maybe can add a little bit of context to the kind of the, the global dynamics through which mining extractivism 
operate, particularly in the current context of the pandemic and the ensuing economic recovery. And I'm going to do three, kind of do it in three parts. First, I'm going to talk about the, the, the intersections between the, the COVID-19 pandemic and extractivism as a development model or as a, uh, an economic model. And then I'm going to think about how this particular moment of economic recovery is accelerating certain processes of extraction um, and how therefore that leads us inevitably to think about transition and the intersections between multiple transitions um, and how land justice um, is at the, a, a, a fundamental and interconnected um, or cross-cutting notion for how we envision um, post-extractive societies in this kind of um, ongoing um, crisis. Um, so to begin, I just want to kind of take us to the um, the root, one of the, the root causes of, 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 of zoonotic diseases such as is COVID-19 and how it's one of the most fundamental factors that leads to these types of diseases is the destruction of habitats um, of, of wild species and the invasion of these by urban settlements as well as the expansion of industrial agriculture themes and issues that are will be really well known to the land justice network. Um, and it's in these situations that where the specific conditions um, for the proliferation of these types of diseases are created um, and, 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 and accelerated. And one of the things that's been striking throughout the way in which globally the, 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 the response has been shaped is how often um, these root causes are, are, are seldom spoken about on the one hand. Um, and instead, we get this uh, a narrative of, of war, one that we, 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 we have come to know is closely associated with the way in which dominant systems of power view nature right from uh, colonialism, where nature was seen as something to be subjugated in order for it to be controlled and exploited, similarly to the way in which peoples of um, European descent viewed um, uh, peoples of the global south. The second thing I want to say about the, 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 the pandemic is how, and again, this won't be news to, to, to any of you, but it, it's just important to emphasize how it's been an x-ray on our societies and exposed existing inequalities uh, and injustices generated by neoliberalism. Um, it's important to understand uh, how, like the, and this is relevant when we think about the climate crisis and the ecological crisis, but if we, if, if, but the pandemic has really exposed some of the deep existing um, economic, racial and gender inequities um, that are really the result of historical exploitation and decades of neoliberal policies. And this is particularly true when it comes to uh, the asymmetries um, um, between the global north and the global south. Um, where fundamentally countries and, and states in the, in the global south were so ill-equipped to be able to guarantee um, their citizens uh, the, the, the very basic needs um, for a dignified life. And in, and in this sort of context, the, the mining industry or mining extractivism, um, along with other sort of sectors that make up of that extractivist development model have been uh, at the heart of a colonial model which um, continues to bring profits to multinational corporations and a wealthy few, while dispossessing countless communities of their lands, water and livelihoods and exploiting workers at the expense of their health and well-being. And we'll hear a lot more throughout um, today's interventions and, and, and in the ensuing discussion about what some of those dynamics of extraction and dispossession and exploitation have been. But during the pandemic, uh, I want to make reference to a report that was 
jointly produced by London Mining Network, Yes to Life, No to Mining, Earthworks based in the US, um, War on Want, um, Terra Justa, um, which is a, a new sort of global solidarity uh, organization, which I recommend highly to all of you, uh, and the Institute of Policy Studies, as well as Mining Watch Canada, which basically analyzed how the, the, the global mining industry was seeking to take advantage uh, and profiteer from the pandemic. So whilst entire populations were in lockdown and eco economies were falling apart, mining companies hopped on the pandemic profiteering bandwagon um, and multiple governments declared mining as an essential activity or responded to industry pressure to do so after a brief shutdown. And we established four sort of trends that were not new to the global mining industry, but that certainly um, accelerated or intensified. And one was that, as I said already, mining didn't stop during the pandemic. Secondly, um, mining operations became sort of vectors for the rapid sp spread of the disease, both for workers, but also for rural communities that have you know, been historically impacted by, by destructive mining. Um, as well as a proliferation in threats to land defenders who were exercising legitimate protest. And uh, fourth, um, kind of laying the groundwork for um, uh, the, the mining, global mining industry or global extractivism to really portray itself as some sort of savior or portray itself or reinvent itself as has been the, the, the tone of, of, of um, the global capitalist class during this pandemic to be able to profit from what ensues. And I want to move on to maybe the, the period of economic recovery. I haven't really been keeping track of how long I've been speaking. So hopefully I've got some minutes left. Seven minutes, okay. Thanks, Hal. Um, and in this moment of economic recovery, what we know is that the worst is really yet to come. Um, the oncoming recession will affect both the global north and the global south. Um, but it's in particular in the global south, you know, there's a, the, the disproportionate impact of, of, of the oncoming recession um, is set to hit hardest. It might lead to a loss of half of all jobs in the global south, you know, where the half of the world's population is already struggling to survive on less than $5 a day, plunging millions into poverty with little or no social protection available. And in this um, sort of oncoming recession and, and, and the outfall from that, we know that um, the, in the global north, most of the conversation around economic recovery has been doused in, in the language of, of, of green recovery, right? So um, uh, really this fundamental um, notion that somehow we can uh, act, activate economic growth and, and GDP growth um, whilst at the same time doing so within the planetary boundaries and within, within the um, kind of the guardrails that are so critical to be able to stop runaway climate change. Um, but as we know, and, and many of you will have studied, this it hasn't sim simply, simply hasn't worked. The logic of green growth, um, um, uh, which puts decoupling or a, sort of a blind faith in decoupling, that is, um, whilst um, uh, offsetting the negative impact of increased consumption in the global north primarily, um, it hasn't, simply hasn't worked. And this is particularly relevant because, as how we'll probably get into a bit more, and I'll end with this, um, many of the, um, one of the central demands uh, that in a way legitimizes and gives a platform to the, uh, the, the corporate power and the world's elites um, in being able to push this narrative of green growth as uh, the, the main sort of driver of economic recovery is the notion that um, the, 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 the transition to re renewable energy is, um, is one where that is one that's simply about the uh, replacing of fossil fuel energy systems to, to ones with renewable energy. And the mining global mining industry has caught on to this fact and said, we are able to provide all of the world's minerals and metals that you need for renewable energy. Um, but really, 
what it's doing and, um, is legitimizing the reproduction of a particular development model, which is set to increase regardless of whether we transition to renewable energies or not in the global south, because it's the economic basis of so many of the global south's um, economies. So um, I think in the questions, um, we're going to get a little bit more into kind of how we can um, really own and develop alternative counter hegemonic narratives um, and build our power to um, usher on another, another form of transition based on communities, um, sovereignty, their rights, um, their justice. Um, but, I'm, and, but I wanted to kind of present that context for, for us to understand the global mining industry is part of a, a broader structural set of injustices and in, in inequalities um, functioning very much to profit from the current moment. Um, and it's in this context where communities uh, are, are resisting and re-existing. So I'll leave it there. Sorry if I run on. No, no. Thanks very much, Seb, for that. Thanks very much indeed. All right, I'll turn over to Hal now. You want to unmute? Yeah, thanks, Bonnie. Can yeah. you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. I'm not <laughs> away with family, so there's a certain amount of chaotic noise, so apologies if that, you know, interrupts or is annoying. And thanks, Seb, for the introduction, which I think is a wonderful context um, and give frees me up to go into some specifics. So the three things that I wanted to try and squeeze, um, you know, brief kind of surveys of into my 10 minutes was first, um, the UK's role in the global mining industry as a global player, which Karima um, alluded to earlier. And is the reason why London Mining Network exists. And then to look at mining in the UK, because I know that that's, you know, what, what you're all looking at, um, well, in terms of land in the UK. Um, and then to look a little bit very quickly, and, and as Seb said, we can do more in the questions, at, um, the resistance and alternatives, um, specifically with regards to policy proposals that are coming up from, from below, as it were, in, in, in anti-extractivist movements. Um, so I'm going to start by talking just a little bit about, a little, putting a little bit more detail on um, the UK's global role um, as a mining sort of powerhouse and um, this is not a new story uh Krima and um and others have written really um excellent articles about how uh, mining extractivism has been at the heart of the british colonial project um since day dot um trying to get those minerals and metals and then creating a space in london where they could be um you know a value could be added to them has been at the heart of that that colonial project for a long time so it's important to, to to understand that whatever we're looking at now those dynamics and most of these mining companies have deep colonial ties and have been you know whatever their conduct is today deeply embroiled in in colonial um, abuses over the years um, but today yeah, London is one of the largest um, hubs for the global mining industry in the world the London Stock Exchange and also the alternatives investment market which are the two exchanges um, in London are uh, you know they they host possibly either the either the largest or the uh, or the second largest number of mining companies in the world depending if you ask a Canadian because they like to claim that as well um, yeah it's kind of a dishonorable claim uh, uh, we also have in a lot of mining companies that have their headquarters in London, partly because the London Stock Exchange is there, but also because it's kind of a bit of a playground, um, as well as the London Metals Exchange and the International Council for Minerals and Metals, which represents some of the largest um, industry players. So in short, uh, it, mining is a big deal for London in particular, but the UK in general. Um, and in a conversation not not too long ago with a, a met someone from the Foreign Office, they said that um, British, Britain is the, the third largest exporter of all minerals, uh, min mining and minerals based goods and services globally. So it's, you know, it's fairly integral. Um, the vast majority of those operations um, are overseas and in the global south that those mining companies are responsible for. Um, and looking into those supply chains and looking at what those companies are doing, it's clear, you know, in each of the cases that mining is an industry that's predicated on harm, 
both to the communities that end up uh, so-called hosting those projects, but also uh, the, the biodiversity and the ecosystems that are destroyed for, for, for that mining. Wherever mining happens, uh, it, you know, an intense amount of PR goes into uh, trying to present it as other than it is, which is, which is an industry predicated on harm. But also UK companies have been uh, in recent years linked to some very large and very public disasters um, which have brought mining more into the spotlight and you know to a certain extent given us a little bit more of a focus on the industry in this country. Most notably would be the Samarco mine waste disaster um, in Brazil uh, which killed many people and, and poisoned the Doce River. Um, London Mining Network have done a lot of work on that and it's worth going to the website which I see Kareem has put into the chat to find out more. So yes, my, London and mining somewhat synonymous um, and it's a massive global player um, and with, with huge consequences for communities across the global south and, and land rights in all of those regions. Um, the second thing that I wanted to talk about briefly is also uh, that the that process of expanding globally in terms of mining has also by and large um, gone hand in hand with the diminishment of domestic mining within the UK. Um, it's not, I mean, as I'm sure Izzy will say later, not necessarily quite in the same way for coal, but for minerals and metals, certainly we have kind of uh, outsourced nearly all production. Um, so so we have to we have to kind of take stock of that but also say well what's happening here now um and when we were part of europe we were we were connected to the raw materials initiative that europe has which has three uh, the strategy has three policies one is to secure overseas supply mostly through aggressive trade strategy the second is to secure domestic supply by harmonizing regulation and policy within europe um to be able to extract more easily in European countries. And the third is circular economy, which um, despite a lot of pomp and circumstances is very much the third wheel um, in that. Uh, and, and we were, when we were part of the EU, uh, well, yeah, as we're on our way out, um, part of a wider pact with Japan and the US to sort of counter Chinese hegemony in, in, in uh, control of large amount of metallic resources. Now that we've left the EU in the UK, there's the usual open question, as there is with many things here, what does this mean for us? Um, and I, But I think that we can expect and we can begin to see in the UK's policies and what's happening with mining in this country, that our approach, that whilst being presented as like a kind of anti-European or becoming more competitive um, with Europe or, or beating Europe, um, which is narrative that is coming out, is mostly similar. So we will be seeking to secure supply from overseas. We're likely to see a lot more bilateral trade treaties with former col colonial countries um, uh, and also the Commonwealth uh, that will be coming up and I would expect um, that a lot of that will have some, you know, subsections and focuses around mineral resources. We're also very much looking at securing domestic supply um, and through the UK's industrial strategy, government and public funds are going towards um, projects in this country, particularly around um, battery metals. So lithium is the biggest, probably most developed example in Cornwall, um, which is being driven for partly by a, an alliance which is called li for uk lithium for the uk um, which is connected with the industrial strategy there are also across the country newish projects um, prospecting for gold so in sparing mountains in Connish, in 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 scotland coking coal projects in in cumbria um, and also prospecting for copper, tin, tantalum and other strategic minerals and metals. So the approach is not so different. And all of this connects back into what Seb was saying. Is we, we're in the midst of these much wider transitions uh, and the, the industry and the mining industry is very keen to position itself as the deliverer of not only the renewable transition, but also digitalization of industry um, uh, and uh, um, what's it called? AI artificial intelligence, all of these, all of these, yeah, too many acronyms for my brain, but um, all of these large 
technological shifts that we're part of the mining industry is 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 has found its pr scene um uh, within that and and with within this country we also have the added flavor of brexit which is to say that um we're going to do all this and our mining industry is something that made us great and can make us great again um so i think that's kind of the picture where we are here um that we are likely to see more attempts to open mines in the uk but also more attempts to establish uh, preferential Britain first um, uh, terms with other countries around the world. Um, and, and, and I would also say an, uh, an increasingly, probably an increasingly aggressive diplomatic approach. Our, di our diplomatic apparatus in this country do a huge amount to ingratiate the mining industry with, with states abroad. Um, it's well well documented in in Africa and in Latin America, so I would expect that you know that will happen. And where there are existing bilateral trade treaties, those will be the basis for that. Um, finally, and I don't think I've got very long, so I won't take up too much time. Um, in terms of a quick survey of resistance and what's happening um, to sort of. Pr preface what we're going to talk about in the questions most of the projects in this country are in their their earlier stages they're prospecting exploring or trying to get their licenses um but where where the mining has become a real threat for example i think most most in the news has been dalradian mining um in in the sperren mountains in uh this is non-fossil fuel mining um uh, where there's been a lot of activity and activism around uh, the gold mining project that they're trying to open up there. Uh, and what's clear is that in each case, uh, that we are now having to fight a battle on two fronts, one against the, the project itself, and then on the other hand, against the this sort of narrative of benevolence that these companies have established, which allows them to find new friends in those who, you know, who are rightly deeply concerned about the climate crisis and it makes it life very difficult for those who are trying to 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 resist because people will say to them well don't we need those things and then you have to get into the question about like big systemic alternatives like Seb saying which takes us immediately away from you know a community's right to say no um, which is where I want to end which is uh, that globally there is a recognition that as these uh, arguments are coming up um, the, the arguments that are being put forward by industry are a trap um, and, and most of the time when you're asked for an alternative it is a trap um, because they, they want you to extol a, a similarly sort of hegemon hegemonic and homogenous uh, solution to the problems caused by the extractive industries and industrial capitalism more broadly uh, and in, in our context here uh, what the, the, the main trap is to say well you shouldn't oppose mining here because if it's done here, we can do it better than we would have to do it elsewhere if you stop this mine. So there's a form of blackmail that's happening here. But the reality is we're within a growth oriented and growth driven global economic system where, you know, exploitation of natural resources has to continue, continue to grow exponentially um, in order to stop the world falling into a recession of the kind we're facing now. Whatever is saved by mining more here the demand will continue to increase so that we just have a situation where it will be mined here and it will also be mined elsewhere and that's the reality that we're facing so um communities around the world are increasingly uh finding a pole of of unity in this idea of a right to say no to mining which is obviously deeply and intimately tied with people's right to land to decide over the future of their territory and what's planned for that, that for those places um so I think that's something we can come back to and I, I, I'll, I'll stop talking now so we can hand over to Izzy, but that's very much becoming uh, a sort of gravitational point for, for organising on these issues in, in the global anti-extractives movement. All right, thank you very much, Hal, for that. So without further ado, Isabel, would you like to carry on from there? <laughs> Hi. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, that was a great context, Seb. And how I felt myself like welling up a little bit because what you're describing is something that we've been struggling with so much lately and uh, uh, of this kind of um, appropriation of climate narratives by 
um, coal mining companies. And it, I think in this time when we're all a little bit more disparate as a, as a movement and as a network, um, I, I've definitely felt a little bit alone in fighting this rhetoric and being like, how can they get away with saying this? And so it's, it's um, I felt your frustration, <laughs> but also wanted to say thank you for like offering that connection because it's, um, it's, it's heartening to hear that other people are working on this same um, frustrating issue. So um, I don't have long. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the impacts of coal extraction in the UK and and links with the coal mining um, internationally. The sort of challenges and successes of, of ending coal. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, I won't say perhaps too much about the current sort of recovery context, um, but I think I can say quite a little about how the companies are responding to and trying to style themselves as sort of saviors in the current multiple crises that we're in. Um, so at Coal Action Network, um, we're a very small organization and we work in support of communities that are organizing to end coal extraction um, towards an end for coal um, in the UK, um, in electricity and in industry. We mainly work with voluntary community groups in the northeast of England and South Wales, but We've also been doing solidarity work with some communities um, in Colombia via London Mining Network and in Russia, where um, currently and historically some of the UK's coal imports come from as well. So coal plants in the UK closing in 2025 or before, um, it, that's on track to happen. But mining is just as easy as it was before. Um, if you can export it or sell it to industry, you can still do it. Um, the planning policy framework has not changed to adapt to the fact that coal-fired power is closing or that the Paris Agreement has happened. Um, so we're still having to fight coal mining applications in the UK and that's the majority of the work that we undertake as, as well as trying to shift policy um, away from this assumption that um, we can keep digging up coal um, and, and this policy, I think, whilst the phase out of coal fire power um, by 2025 has been a great step, um, I feel it's occurred as the policy that excludes the supply side of mining because it's been driven primarily um, by um, European centric um, organizations um, who have kind of looked mainly at the emissions end of um, of coal and said like what policy can stop these emissions and there hasn't been a, a big drive as part of that consultation to end coal there was not enough emphasis on where the coal comes from because there's really not with the general like NGO campaigning and lobbying and think tank world there's not really a great deal of connection with um, the people and the communities that live um, with the effects of coal mining. Um, and so there's not a huge amount of emphasis on the human rights aspect, um, um, which if there had been, might have led to kind of more of a holistic policy that um, targets the supply side and not just the consumption side of coal. Um, and that's kind of what we need to move towards because what we're seeing is that coal mining companies are basically pivoting to say, um, oh yeah, we know that coal for electricity is over and isn't that a good thing, but we really need coal for industry because um, if we don't have coal for steel production, where are your wind turbines going to come from? Um, and if we don't have coal for cement, how are we going to build more houses to solve the housing crisis? Um, and suddenly that's what their coal is for and that's what they care about. Um, and so the impacts in the UK, I mean, open cast mining um, is not the same as deep pit mining of the pre Thatcher era, um, not the same as the tradition of, of the Durham coal fields that we've all heard so much about, um, which used to imply, uh, used to employ um, whole communities of, of men um, in, um, 
in pits that would be dug underground. Instead, it involves opening up the whole surface of um, of the landscape, much as it um, anybody familiar with international mining um, would have seen those kinds of images. Um, that's also um, the kind of mining that's um, explored in the UK as well. Um, and so it has some of the same impacts, um, although, you know, in terms of loss of green space and amenity, biodiversity, air pollution, um, and a general lack of community cohesion when a community is centered around um, around a green space and um, uh, and and it's part of people's connection to the land and their sense of place. Um, so communities who've lost a lot in the demise of the deep pit coal mining industry in areas like the northeast and South Wales um, find that the amenity that's that they are left with is then threatened or taken away from them by the open cast coal mining that has come to replace the traditional deep pit coal mining. Um, it, it, it provides far fewer jobs um, and doesn't, um, unlike sort of big international mining projects, um, they're much smaller in scale, which means that they last a lot less of a long time. So the workforce doesn't get as organized, which stays for a couple of years and then it goes. Um, so we had a really interesting exchange in, um, in the Northeast between um, some visitors from a coal mine in Colombia, uh, from workers, so, um, one of the, the president of the um, mining union, Sintra Carbon, um, and one of the community leaders who was opposed to the mine, um, they both came over and met community members in um, County Durham near to this mine, which is now closed this week. Um, and they um, found it really um, interesting that, um, that there was a coal mine that was so tiny, but it was right next to people's houses. Um, and, and they were surprised and expressed that this would never happen in Colombia. So like there's kind of um, this assumption that mining is better or worse somewhere else, but it, it actually people who came from Colombia had a huge, experienced a huge amount of sympathy and, um, and connection with the people that we introduced them to in um, the Northeast. And that's happened every time that we've done such an introduction that there's been a real shared um, uh, feeling and understanding about ownership to the land, about the that ownership being kind of abruptly taken away. And that happens in, in the UK when um, coal mining was um, dismantled but deliberately by, by Margaret Thatcher in the 70s, is that communities had their kind of means of self-identification and means of um, being, you know, a, what they saw as a sustainable community withdrawn abruptly. And at the same time, in fact, between um, one of our um, good friends and uh, people who used, somebody who used to work at Coal Action Network um, came from a, a former mining town that was actually, um, the pit was closed at the same time that Cesar in Colombia was opened. And that's where the coal started to come from that replaced the coal that used to be mined in the UK. So there's quite a strong connection between um, the pain and hardship that has been felt for many decades now in the former mining regions of the UK and in the kind of equally violent imposition of coal mining in other parts of the world, including Colombia and in Russia. Um, and it's so the, 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 that, the kind of context that um, the, the, sorry, <laughs> um, what I'm trying to say is that the, this closure of the mines that um, created the really troubled context that we find ourselves in in different parts of the UK now that feel disenfranchised um, and deliberate and, and, and clearly anxious about where jobs and uh, stability is going to come from in the future. That um, 
that disruption that occurred quite deliberately in the, in the eight, 70s and 80s basically flowed into the pattern of mining and colonialism um, that Hal and Seb have spoken about um, because it, it basically it, it, it was part of this transfer um, of violence from one part of the world to another. Um, and, and we found that, I don't know how much more time I've got, I'm probably going to finish quite soon. Um, we found that um, the difficulty, one of the difficulties now, like Hal has been saying, is that the coal mining companies are now able to say, the ones that remain in the UK operating are now able to say things like, if we don't get it from here, we'll be getting it from Colombia, we'll be getting it from Russia. Um, and as, as Hal has quite rightly said, it's not kind of the, this question of substitution of one minute, like one mineral or mine for another is kind of, um, is, is a completely false, uh, well, we found an, um, an economist um, at the UCL, Professor Paul Eakins, described it as economic nonsense because the company has to say, you know, which mine is going to close internationally if our mine opens. And if, if you can't say that, then you are contributing more coal to the world. Um, you're doing more damage, you're creating more harm, you're creating more CO2. So you can't say, you know, our coal is cleaner because it's local. It's like, it's just the same as coal from somewhere else, but you've made more of it. Um, and if anything, you've made the coal cheaper um, overall because there's, there's more of it on the market. So what we're finding is that um, coal mining companies are kind of continuing to benefit um, narratively anyway from the fact that coal was off, like increasingly offshored in the past um, and is being import increasingly imported. Um, because they can kind of strengthen these claims about British jobs and British industry by also reaching out to the sector that cares about climate change. And we've heard um, the UK climate, uh, UK energy minister um, make um, a comment in, in Parliament that basically echoed that sort of superficially common sense argument. Um, so it's, uh, and we've also seen West Cumbria um, mining proposals for a, a 50 year coking coal mine in in Whitehaven West West Cumbria be approved by Cumbria County Council because they've said yeah that seems that seems right it's carbon neutral but fortunately that's that, that's been the subject of the legal challenge and it's now gone back to the drawing board but there are um, like uh, central government and local government uh, decision makers that have bought into this logic um, and it's really troubling so I think what we need is a kind of um, an effort across anybody who's challenging any extractivism in the in the UK or or more broadly to 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 challenge this logic that because they're all clearly reading from the same playbook um, at the moment and I think we have to be as well. Um, yeah, and, and I think I think I'll just finish by saying that I think one of one of the key problems that's already been suggested is just a lack of vision around what we would have instead. Um, because if you're offered, you know, two options that are almost as bad as one another, you know, coal from here or coal from somewhere else. Um, you're, you're operating in without, that, that's a block to imagination about what we could have instead um, and what people deserve. And so it's kind of, I, I think also the COVID crisis um, has played into that because the companies that we've been challenging have found it easier to say, just open our minds now because people need jobs now. Um, and that dispenses with the, the root of examining how else could people's needs be met? Um, do we have to keep extracting 
for in order for people to have jobs. Um, so these kind of multiple crises, um, I think if if we don't allow ourselves space to imagine and articulate an alternative, sort of trap us in the dominant ways of thinking. Um, and 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 if we allow coal mining companies to dominate the narrative, then they will just, you know, offer you know, two bad options. Um, so we need to be working together and working with communities to articulate and offer something else. Um, yeah, I'll finish there. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, all right, as a, the chair, I'm going to take a certain prerogative and ask uh, some questions of our speakers before we open it to the floor. Um, obviously, from our people's land policy perspective, we feel that land reform is very important. So I was going to ask the speakers, what effect would it have if uh, we did have land reform in the sense that the public in some way, whether it was the local community, whether it was the public as a whole, actually had much more say in actually how our land was used. Because I think the general picture we've got from the speakers very much is using land for mining is a problem. It's a problem for the environment and it's a problem for communities, maybe not just those living near it, but if it causes climate change, then obviously it's for the, the world community is a problem. So would it, what effect would it have if we could actually take control of the land and be able to make decisions ourselves rather than leaving it up to mining companies to make decisions about how that land was used? So I don't know who would like to answer that first. Seb, possibly, yes, I'll unmute. You want to unmute yourself? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the work that the network is doing in thinking about land integrally and holistically, i.e. not just land and the imaginary that we have about that being a field or some sort of green space, but actually the space we inhabit and we create community around and we have ownership over and collective decision uh, making over is, is, liber is, is a liberatory approach and one that really speaks to the sort of interconnected and interdependent ways in which um, we interact and um, how we can reshape our economy but at the at the heart of that thinking is an assumption and correct me if i'm wrong but the the assumption is that in order to have ownership and control and um, collective access over land um, we also need to be able to guarantee that is in order to guarantee the the a dignified life for 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 all and we can't do that unless we also have control over the way in which we produce consume store and access energy and so i think um and then on on that's on one level and on the, on the other level if we're thinking about guaranteeing um some sort of democratic control over um land and space and territory then we're also assuming that that is at the um that that is like a the the, the at the root of addressing the current inequities and inequalities that exist with regards to the way in which land is currently distributed in this country which means that it's doing that in a fair and just way means frontlining the way in which those inequalities affect us. So all of our um, all of our, our proposals and the way in which we develop these analyses are deeply connected. Um, whether it's energy production, whether it's access to land to guarantee food sovereignty. So I think, and add one interesting and possibly useful illustration is, and and uh, 
those of us here on this call who work with communities in Latin America or in other places in the global south who view land not as a as again as a as a, as a sort of field of sorts but as as territory i.e the space through which we connect spiritually religiously the space with which we in, with, through which we interact and reproduce life and reproduce tradition and guarantee other forms of non-extract non-extractive forms of life to guarantee our well-being um already help us to think about kind of those 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 connections and maybe that's a an interesting um thought to just bring to the space in terms of how um, land justice um, is fundamentally tied to energy justice, um, perhaps. Can't hear you, Bonnie. Did Hal or Isabel want to comment on that? my question just about land or i could say a few thoughts about land and um, what i've seen is that um the kind of this sort of sense of ownership or maybe it's hard to say I, I don't want to equate with how people in indigenous communities relate spiritually to land but i have observed and and had many conversations about spiritual connection to land among people in the UK and people who've grown up in um, in and around the areas that um, are threatened or destroyed by open cast coal mining. And one really nice example is in the the Bradley site that closed this week um, and was refused an extension as a result of the community campaign all the way through the operating of the site and while they were campaigning against the extension they met every month um, to have a vigil on the land to reconnect with the land and assert ownership over it and reconnect as a community and build and share memories share stories um, share poems enjoy being there and make and keeping the land meaningful to them and that was a really strengthening, um, a really purposeful um, activity that often um, communities feel really, um, really disempowered and, and really alienated from their landscape after they lose a campaign against the mine. Um, and, and kind of some people describe feeling sort of trapped in their homes because the areas that they used to walk and the places that they were familiar with were no longer accessible to them or were kind of invaded um and and these people sort of really resisted that um, because they knew that it wouldn't allow them to defeat the company if they gave in to the kind of implication that the person who has the right to the land is the person who has the right to exploit it and they subverted that and they won so i think that it's about challenging kind of mentally the assumption that um, the, the person with the mineral rights is the person with the right to be there or the right to have a connection to it or the right to have a say over it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I did, I'll just have one more question which was about policy because that's the other thing. Could I just jump in to say yeah. that if anybody in the audience has questions please write them in the chat yeah. so that we can get to them. Sorry, go ahead. Who should we send them to? Uh, we, we're only able to sort of send them to a few people. Um, I think the chat is now open so okay. that it will go to everyone. Thank you. Okay. So just about policy again. Uh, so about what do you think i mean you raised the big issue i think is the, is the economic argument it seems what makes it so very difficult is that um people use the economic argument as a reason why mining has to continue to the extent that it does um can you think of any ideas of what kind of policies might help to remove that economic argument in other words that we could actually think of alternative ways of people making money or people having job opportunities um how do you see i suppose alternative ways 
rather than, as you talked about, extractivism as a model for development, whether that be here or globally. I can take a, a quick, yeah, I mean, that's the question, isn't it? So I'm not going to pretend to say, I'll, I'll say that whatever I say is partial and probably wrong in many different ways. But um, I think the, one, of the, one of the crucial things, even before we start thinking about alternatives, is just to say that mining isn't that profitable if you take into account all of the costs. And if the, if the companies were forced to bear the costs of the environmental and social so-called externalities of their operations, very few of these industrial scale mining projects would be profitable from the get go. Uh, so the massive subsidization of the industry, um, and, I, and I predict, I, I would predict that we'll see a migration as time goes on from heavy subsidization of fossil fuels as our key energy pro providers to um, uh, to minerals and metals um, uh, in the coming years, that those subsidies, just as we're saying they should be stripped from fossil fuel um, companies, should be stripped from other extractors companies. Uh, and we should also be looking at different um, regulatory regimes, which force a, what, what's been talked about in food circles in terms of industrial agriculture more to date, um, which is a true cost accounting of, of mining's actual impacts. Uh, that would place it perhaps in a, you know, we wouldn't, it wouldn't have the the precedence as an economic activity that it currently enjoys. Um, and, you know, there would be less, um, you know, there would be less need for those operations to go ahead. Then, uh, yeah, you know, I'm just sort of thinking about how to relate it back to the context here as well. I mean, I think that whilst there's been a lot of successful attempts to capture the narratives around a green economic recovery or a just transition um you know to in the wrong direction these are moments of uncertainty and therefore offer um opportunity for you know alternative ways of thinking which said um, mentioned before uh, and i think ultimately i think liz leslie put in the chat um you know is is an economy that doesn't grow enough no but it would be a good start um uh, and it's fairly crucial and there are some you know there are increasingly vocal sort of constellations of scholars and activists and community members who are uh taking those uh things forward and in this country one of the more promising arenas is that we now have an all party part of all party parliamentary group on the limits to growth uh, and so i think broadening and increasing the influence of those kind of forums uh, uh is, is going to be really important in so far as we are engaging with mainstream politics. Um, and then the other thing, um, as you said at the start, Bonnie, I think about uh, being in solidarity is that there are communities who are um, in, in land reform or, or sort of asserting rights over land and re reclaiming, rewilding, retaking land being a central strategy. Um, there are many examples that we can learn from which are happening most of the time against huge repression from the powers that be. Um, and not only do we need to show our solidarity with them when there is a link to, for example, the place that we live here in the UK, but also uh, trying to connect them up to each other. Uh, I'll put a link in the in the box and some of the work we've been doing is yes to like notes mining is to try and identify some of the communities who have done that most compellingly everywhere from Myanmar to Papua New Guinea, Finland, Galicia and others and try and understand and connect those um, those communities better so we can understand yeah what does that practice of creating alternatives look like and how do we how do we change the conversation around around because we're constantly framed as negative when we say no to mining oh you're saying no to jobs no to development um, no to modernity no we're saying when we say no to mining we're saying yes to life we're saying yes to a biologically and culturally diverse space, as as is Izzy said. You know, we're saying yes to having those important community amenities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The list is is kind of endless. So I think building uh, campaigns around that positive poll, uh, which has been done poorly often by the climate movement, um, can be a, a big uh, opportunity. And I think land reform and and, and drawing on people's innate connection to land, I think is a really important part of that. Well, I think maybe we should open it up now to everyone else to ask questions. Alec, did you want to take over the, uh, the 
question and answer comments, plus there's quite a lot in chat already. Yep. Well, I have one all... to say before I'm, I'm going to disappear a bit because I'm going to organize some breakout rooms. And I really do encourage you to stay for the breakout rooms because it does give everyone a chance to discuss in smaller groups some of the issues. So hopefully it would be good if people stayed on for that part of the meeting. Great, thanks Bonnie, thanks for the speakers. Um, I'm just going to moderate the questions because um, there's quite a few coming up. So if anyone wants to ask a question in the chat or even put their hand up, then I can see you on to, to you on mute. Um, Ella, I see you have a question about deep sea mining. Would you like to ask your question to the speakers? Yeah, so um, it's not actually about deep sea mining. Um, this was something that I was a bit confused about as well, but there's a difference between sort of seafloor mining and deep sea mining and what's happening here off the coast of Blythe is uh, sea floor mining rather than deep sea mining. Um, so to hear them sort of tell it, there's basically an underwater tractor that goes along and picks up what they describe as like potatoes full of nickel. Um, you know, like that simple, no harm to anything. Um, and as far as I'm aware, it's like still very experimental. Um, and this is the only place in the UK where it's happening. Um, Blythe is like a former mining community as well but yeah I just wondered if like any of the speakers had any thoughts on that or any knowledge about it um, it's quite exciting I think for a lot of the young people who are hoping to get like apprenticeships and sort of renewable energy technology um, this is like a fairly deprived area um, but yeah I'd just be really excited to hear your all your thoughts on that Great, thanks Ellie. Um, does anybody want to answer that? Uh, how did I see you go on mute for a moment? Yeah, I flickered there. Um, I work with communities in the Pacific on deep sea mining. I'd, I'm, I, maybe we can connect outside of this because it would be interesting to understand more. The two interesting observations I would have is that sometimes the, the actual technologies aren't that different, but sea floor and deep sea are referred to separately depending on whether the operation is happening within the exclusive economic zone of the country so if it's off the coast of the uk but in our territorial waters it might be referred to as seafloor whereas if it was off you know in the deep sea you know out in international waters but in areas which are concessions are being given or or different countries have a claim to those areas it may be referred to as deep sea mining so i'm not i'm not sure and i need to read more and i could put you in contact with some people but um, it sounds very similar with the harvesting of these nodules. And the other thing to say is that the northeast of this country um, is where a lot of the, the sort of cutting edge deep sea mining uh, technology is being produced. So, for example, those um, the resistance in, the, in, in Papua New Guinea, for example, the, the machines were exported from Newcastle um, to go and to well, they're now rusting because the. Uh, the campaign was very successful, thank goodness. Um, but yeah, it's, it is a it is a hub for for that in that emerging industry. Great, thanks, Al. Um, do any of the other speakers have anything they'd like to contribute to that question? Or no? Oh, oh Seb, do you like? No, I was just going to say, there's nothing else that we could add beyond what Al knows. <laughs> okay, that's all right. Uh, thank you very much, Ali, for your question. Um, Richard Solly, I see you've um, made two comments. Is there something you would like to add to the discussion? Um, I'm not sure that I can add more to, to what I've written, but I think this issue of employment and the promise of employment is an important one to try to counter because uh, Isabel mentioned earlier about how most of the mining that happens now is not like the the community enhancing mining that took place in in this country for so many years with the, with communities gathered around huge employment in coal mines now companies are making every effort possible to reduce the amount of employment and increase the amount of mineral produced per job rio tinto and bhp the the two biggest mining companies in the world both of which are listed on the london stock exchange uh, boasting about the increasing um, remote automation of their mines in Western Australia, where they can have a few workers in a, a, a room in Perth in Western Australia controlling driverless trucks and driverless diggers and driverless trains 
up in the, the northern part of Western Australia, speaking up iron ore. So uh, the, the jobs argument is a bit of a hollow one, and particularly when you compare jobs created with jobs destroyed on the land. It, clearly not the same in every place, but the example that really sticks in my mind is from when I was in Colombia in 2002 and went across the border into Venezuela and the same British mining company was involved on both sides of the border, same coal deposit, and they were boasting about creating 400 new jobs by, by uh, digging a, a new coal export port. And I was told by local indigenous people that this port would then destroy 36,000 jobs in inshore fishery. So you compare creating 400 jobs with destroying 36,000 other jobs. And um, Hal has done a lot of work on uh, with various communities around the world on alternatives to mining. And I bet a lot of those alternatives are more employment intensive than the multinational mining companies' uh, proposals. Um, the, the, the one other thing I'll add since I'm yattering away now is um, one thing that I think Hal may not have mentioned in his response just now about deep sea mining, and I don't know to what extent this is the case with, with um, inshore seabed mining, is the massive destruction of the, the seafloor ecosystem with uh, unknown impacts on ecosystems that we know so little about and possibly species that we're not even aware of the existence of. The, the, the sea floor is a hugely important ecosystem full of unknowns like the, the rainforest is. And so thinking that you can uh, drag stuff across it to, to get the minerals off it that you want and you're not going to do any lasting damage is ridiculous. And there, uh, it, it's certainly in um, inshore um, or, or close to the shore uh, seabed mining in the, the Pacific, Pacific Rim, there's a, a big worry among fishing communities that, that seabed mining will destroy the fishery and destroy jobs in, in fisheries. But I don't know whether that's at all relevant in Blythe. Uh, and I don't know what the um, ecosystem is on the North Sea floor near Blythe. Maybe in the case of Blythe, seabed mining is utterly brilliant and if everybody wants it, yippee. But it, it's, it's something to be um, particularly um, concerned about and find out more about before um, companies are allowed carte blanche to dig up the seabed. Thanks, Great. I'll shut up. Oh, thank you, Richard. That was really interesting. Um, do any of the speakers have any further comments to make about interesting point about automation and Mining as wider impacts, or oh, that's okay. Um, I see we have another comment from Mary Fee. Uh, Mary, would you like to um, contribute your comment to the discussion? Hello. Um, Hello. Oh, hang on. Can you hear me now? Oh, yep, yeah, we can hear. You. I'll just put the light on. Is that a bit better? Um, yeah, uh, I suppose my, mining mining's always been about making a profit, hasn't it? Um, uh, and um, nowadays people are sort of thinking a bit more about survival. You know, how can we survive? So. Um, like they found out other ways of making energy through wind and things like that, wind and water energy. So therefore, uh, is there any need to keep digging up coal? And I was, I was um, wondering if there are any, uh, if there are any unique um, substances that are being mined that we that we can't manage without. You know, are there any exceptions to? Um, uh, you know, substances that have unique properties. Um, that's, the, uh, hope that makes sense. Oh, thank you, Barry. Um, do any of the speakers would like to comment on that? Oh yes, Seb, would you like to have a go? Thanks, Alec. And 
And thanks, Mary, for your question. I think um, you know when it's it's often an organic response to try and think what is the thing that's going to replace the current way in which we produce energy in order to be able to meet our energy needs. But one of the kind of fundamental arguments at the core of um, energy justice, if you like, or climate justice, is that it's not so much the technology or the efficiency with which we produce the, the energy that's the problem. The problem is the way in which we disproportionately consume that energy in certain sectors. So I don't know the, the figures off the top of my head, but I think it's over 80% of the world's energy is consumed in the global north. So it's not, the, the question isn't about, is there a way in which we replace it, way in which we produce renewable energy? And actually part of that redistribution and that, um, um, of that energy transition has to absolutely include renewable energy. I think that the, the technology is there and we and, um, research and design into the way in which we can be more efficient to produce um, that those energy is, are is, is fundamental, but the question is, is 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 a social one, and it's one that's based on justice about the way in which that energy is consumed, and who consumes it, and who doesn't, and that's when you get into the 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 the, the social responses. And I think yeah. just to add kind of to the question about alternatives that was being spoken about earlier, um, there are, you know there are really wealth green new deals that can spur processes of decarbonization um, and guarantee social justice and uh, address social inequities but the, the 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 challenge is how those iterations of green new deals in places like europe or the us or or canada don't happen at the expense of workers and communities in the global south i think that's the question that we should begin to ask ourselves when thinking about our alternatives. And I think that's, then we'll get to, yeah, we'll get to the, the, the responses that help us to build power from an a, 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 a unabashedly internationalist perspective. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. All right, that's, thanks, not, that's not really what I was asking about. Um, and uh, it, it, I, I was involved in Ure Romania uranium mining about 50 years ago um, and uh, I think that we've decided that uh, we can probably do without uranium um, but uh, are there any unique substances that are need for te technological purposes that are mined that we can't do without? I mean if we're just thinking about you know energy we, we, we're using we're burning up far more energy than we need we don't really need to be flying around all over the place we can all kind of calm down a bit and stay where we are stay where we are a bit more and start growing vegetables what I'm talking about is there anything like what they use in what they use in phones or uh, are there any unique substances that still need to be mined that's what I'm asking about I, I don't know the answer. Do <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows the direct answer, but I do know that coal, I've seen um, mining companies attempt to convince people that there there are and it's their minerals. Um, I've I've seen a mining company try and convince people that coal is needed for food, for paper, for solar panels, um, and as if there's no other way of producing food or paper or energy you know um so i think it's um it's not i think it's just about being vigilant to to yeah understanding what the how ne how needed a certain mineral is but also i think crucially um trying to reduce our dependence on these things like you know if there is just uh, and and it will it will involve thinking further outside the box like if there is a particular mineral that's needed for like tablets and there's, you know, we should stop mining it. Well, what do we use tablets for? Should we use something different? You know what I mean? So I think we also need to approach it from, from the other way. Like how do we, like 
what do we actually need to use, how much of it, and how could we distribute it or recirculate it? So like steel production, for example, um, that can be, uh, steel can be recycled and remade using electricity, which can be renewable. So there can be a completely carbon neutral way of repurposing steel, which doesn't require any more mining. So we might decide that we, steel's got unique properties and we need it, but we could, we could recirculate it instead of um, mining more of it. So I think there's different ways to approach like that issue. But I don't know the direct answer to your question. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like to add something if that's okay. Yep, go ahead Ella. Um, so I, I work for an organisation called People and Planet on uh, their sweatshop free campaign, which is about um, basically trying to challenge like workers and human rights abuses within the electronics industry. And part of that, like a big part of that is um, challenging extractivism as well. Um, so yeah, like there's definitely some metals and minerals that are like considered to be essential for transitioning towards like a green economy and, and lithium I think is pretty high up that list. Um, but I just wanted to kind of like gently explore something that was said, which is about, you know, um, is there anything that, you know, we can't do without? And I guess I would, I would ask there, you know, who, who is we? Because I think if we were looking at, um, you know, what we needed to maintain maybe a European standard of living, then the list of what we can't do without is a lot longer than if we were looking at, at maybe different people. So I would just like to sort of, um, yeah, I guess like a green economy or whatever you want to call it, like looks different to different people. And, you know, depending on what that looks like would depend what sort of metals and minerals are on that list. Uh, and also it's like a fiercely debated uh, topic in the scientific community of like what is needed, how much of it do we need. Um, so that's like a really, really big topic that's still very much up for debate. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Great. Thank you, Ella. And thank you, everyone else. Um, yeah. David, it's, it's, do you have a question? From a pretty bit ignorant basis, I'm aware that there is a variety of ways and uh, of getting lithium in different places more or less uh, ethically. Obviously, it's an awful lot of lithium not yet reclaimed. Sorry, that's my cat. Um, or sorry, rather the cat I'm looking at. Um, there's uh, an awful lot that could be reclaimed uh, already. Whether we can do without mobile phones, probably we're not going to. But rare earth metals anyway. I mean, it's just driving on the technology and a responsible rather than an irresponsible way. Okay, and I think I better mute the cat. <laughs> Great, thank you, David. Um, I think we have time for just a very few more questions. I mean, uh, there's a question here from Jean Jacques. Uh, Jean Jacques, would you like to ask your question to the speakers? I think so, but it sounds as though they're winding down. Sorry, I, I don't specifically had a question. I, oh, I wasn't okay. looking to get directly involved. I was just trying to address what Mary was trying to say earlier. Okay. Oh, well, thank you. Fact that, yeah, um, unfortunately, I mean, we should be aiming for as close enough to a circular economy as possible, which is recycling as much as possible. Uh, and there's a lot of good that goes into the... Uh, it, the way that we're investing in sort of the recycling industry and that's all that's always a good way i mean we're getting so much from phones and and laptops that we're not using anymore so that we can take the minerals and metals out of those to put them towards building it for the future and this is all very well and good but unfortunately there are a lot of metals out there there's a lot of the, uh, minerals out there that we can't recycle or that won't be recycled uh, and if we're faced with a population that's growing, there's simply not enough in the system that you can just sort of keep running around, even with aluminium or steel, which are 100% recyclable in their pure form. I just wanted to chime in with that because <coughs> I actually have a background in mining. But yeah, there's a lot of things that, you know, you can't, uh, you can't recycle, but we should be aiming to recycle everything uh, and absolutely everything that we can. What the, the question about energy is a different question. We know that we have an alternative to energy. So coal is out of the question, really. We should really be off that and onto renewable energy. 
it's 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 this the idea of of the metals this irreplaceable the irreplaceable metals that the way that technology is going i mean there really is no no, no alternative you have hundreds of different elements you have tens of tens of elements in in your screen right now which is which all came from a mine in china and the only reason they came from a mine in china is because china have enough of it to drive the price down uh, there is simply no alternative if we want to keep uh, the um, technology moving or we, we can we can halt it we can go back but there isn't uh, what we have at the moment what we like to enjoy our, our screens our computers our phones and everything we rely on this huge circular economy uh, so i just wanted to chime in with that I've, i have been a fly on the wall this whole time i'm going to mute myself now so i can go away <laughs> well thank you john jacks that was a uh, really interesting do um any of the speakers have any comments they'd like to make at this point before a final question or Uh, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, there was one other question from Richard, um, which was about Black Lives Matter and the debate on decolonization, asking for reports uh, that connect the imperial history of UK based companies um, with uh, the power and control they seek to exert today. So I think maybe i don't know if richard from or karima want to you know because i think there is upcoming uh things stuff on that that may be of interest and also some of karima's writing may be of direct interest to you richard um and then before i stop talking i also wanted to say that these are really hard um issues to think through because we're both trying to think about individual communities and also macro scale economics and these are not things that sit happily together um there's a really great phrase by an anthropologist called stuart kirsch which he described colliding ecologies the logic of a community that's sustaining itself from the land and uh, that you know a global capitalist economy are I mean, they couldn't be more different in many ways. Um, but there is some really great work happening, uh, particularly in Latin America, around uh, what a post-extractivism could look like. And um, what that doesn't look like is no extraction ever full stop, because our ancestors were, you know, quarrying flints out of chalk thousands of years ago. There are, and, and there are artisanal long-standing traditions of indigenous extraction, but those are different from extractivism, which is a system of economic exploitation um, along racial and um, class and caste and other lines. Um, and that's what we want to get rid of. And I think it helps to place the focus on that, on the ism of the thing. And, and one scholar in particular who might be of interest to you is one called Eduardo Godinas. A lot of his writings are in English. And he talks about this difference between uh, predatory extractivism, which is kind of what we have now, where you know there's, there's very little uh, quote unquote red tape or regulation to hold companies back. It's pretty much a free for all operating through corruption um, and extreme lack of oversight to a sort of sensible extraction where it's kind of highly bureaucratic, um, centralized, often state controlled, but ultimately still very destructive and not taking into account other life worlds, uh, other species, um, the rights of communities and so on. And then his de definition of what he calls ind indispensable extraction rather than extractivism, which is to say that in a society where we have, we had a, if we had a, uh, a society that sat within planetary boundaries that was equal and redistributive and dealt with the, um, you know, the many intersectional and intergenerational issues that we have today, we would probably still find that we would have to come to an agreement about how where and when to extract some things that could be demonstrably shown to be needed or convivial to that society and the well-being of all um, and so i think that idea of like indispensable extraction that that we only do as much as we have we we have to do because it's it is destructive and we do it in a just way um, is probably as close as we have to like a fully fleshed out idea of what we should be aiming for and, and land reform and considering minerals as a commons and other things are absolutely a part of that. So I think, yeah, it would be, that's a good, maybe a good signpost for further reading. Great. Thank you, Hal. Um, so Bonnie, do we want to move into wider discussion now? I'm aware some of the speakers need to leave as well. <laughs> Um, I'm a bit worried that we don't have that many people and if people then 
go off when we move into we're not that many people <laughs> so it seems to me that if we could get if other people wanted to comment on some of the key questions then it seems to me that we could stay all together like this I mean, the issue that we particularly wanted to discuss in the breakout rooms was, again, to, it's already been discussed as issues to do with what kind of policies that we could we could actually adopt. And people have come up with a, a lot of ideas and also a lot everything about the bigger issues that we need to consider as well. So uh, if people are happy, we can just carry on discussing. And uh, if anyone else would like to contribute about what they think needs to change. I mean, I know one thing that um, we had talked about, for example, was uh, about this had to do more with how we could support people in the global south, had to do with indigenous rights, because um, there, there was talk about that indigenous people should have the right to refuse mining, not just to be consulted, but to actually refuse. And uh, wouldn't it be possible, it, what kind of policies could the UK government actually impose on companies that operated abroad that they had to implement to make sure that uh, local peoples were actually given the right to refuse? And maybe any other ideas about what kind of policies we could, we could, we could have here that would then support people elsewhere. I was also thinking about trade policies, what things we wouldn't import. We could have policies about about limiting the kind of things, you know, like fair trade issues. We could have policies on fair mining. So any ideas from the speakers about what kind of policies we could actually develop in the UK to uh, facilitate a more just uh, system? I, I have to go, unfortunately, but um, in any case, I think Richard from London Mining Network is probably the best person to ask about those policies in the UK. Um, but I just want to say um, thank you so much for having me and, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to following up as well. Great. Thank you very much. Very much. Really. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. So I think, Richard, did you want to take up that point? Yeah, if I may, um, I just want to say something on other Richard's question uh, that, that Hal um, was responding to. Seb has put in the chat uh, box a link to a report that various of us were involved with recently and that Seb was mentioning earlier about the, the way the mining industry is using the COVID-19 crisis for its own a benefit because Richard's question involved uh, control of, of um, I can't find it now, control of, of knowledge and um, uh, where are we now? Um, yeah, power and control they seek to exert today over our knowledge, materials, well-being, etc. Uh, so that that report about COVID-19 shows how the, the some of the steps that the mining multinationals are taking to control the narrative around COVID-19 and make themselves look good. Uh, many of the reports that you'll find on the reports uh, page of, of our London Mining Network website deal with the link between mining companies and um, both uh, imperial or neo-colonial control and uh, control of narrative and what counts as knowledge. I mean, one of our trustees, Diana Salazar, who works particularly on mining in Colombia, has done a lot of work on how land-based people's knowledge of their land and mining impacts on their land is not taken as knowledge by governments or the mining industry. So you can have uh, land-based people saying this and this has happened to our land because of the, the mine, that doesn't count. It only counts if you get some northern academics, I don't mean northern English, I mean global northern <laughs> academics, going to the land, looking at it and saying, oh yes, this and this is happening to their land, then it counts as knowledge. So at the root of it is utter contempt for land-based peoples and the deliberate violent imposition of a particular cultural way of relating to land and that's linked in with the 
the notion that if you pay people money for taking over their, their land, that's good, that's okay, and only uh, a, a complete idiot would fail to accept the equivalence between money and land. So if people are saying, no, we, if you give us all the money in the world, we still don't want your mine, that's seen as completely illegitimate. Um, we've got a report coming up soon, in the next two months maybe, uh, about mining and militarism. It's going to be called martial mining, and that deals a little bit with the colonial roots of mining, uh, particularly looking at uh, th three of the bigger companies uh, listed on the London Stock Exchange, BHP, Rio Tinto and Anglo-American. Uh, but it also deals with the close link between um, uh, particular minerals and particular forms of violence and particular forms of dispossession. Uh, but finally, on Richard's question, the, the control of narrative about what's going on is a huge issue with mining because mining companies have loads of money to throw around. And even before COVID-19, came along and, and exacerbated it all. They were spending lots of money on sponsoring this and sponsoring that to make it look as though their presence in a, in a particular community is wholly beneficial. And they also often control radio stations or television stations, or if they don't control them, they advertise on them. And so that's really important that the, that the um, media don't upset them. And a good example of that very close to home which I do think has affected their reporting on um, mining issues, although they do have a lot of good reporting on mining issues. The Guardian has, uh, in the fairly recent past, had as a major sponsor Anglo-American. So uh, trying to get really critical articles about the Serajon coal mine in Colombia that Izzy was mentioning earlier is difficult because Anglo-American owns one third of that mine. So I've noticed in recent months that the most critical articles about British mining companies that appear in The Guardian appear in the Australian version of The Guardian. Uh, anyway, there we are, control of, of um, knowledge. Izzy's going to say something. I just want to, um, thanks Richard, that, uh, that was really useful. I just want to say something in response to Bonnie's question about um, policy. Uh, changes but first um, I just want to quickly say um, Gabriella I'm really appreciating your comments in the chat and if you would like to say something before the end of the session I want to encourage you and anybody else who hasn't spoken yet because I bet everybody's got really interesting things to share and I think there's few enough of us remaining that we could all share something um, but very quickly um, I I think that um, the real difficulty with answering a question like what policy could change is that it kind of automatically gets you into the framework that we're working in and being like kind of oh what lever could shift here or there that would make it easier for us to navigate this really unfair frame paradigm that we're in um and i, I so i would suggest that i mean in an ideal world that planning decisions would approach completely the other way around from how they are approached now. So instead of a mining company going to a community and kind of begrudgingly saying, we want to do this project, are you going to stand in our way? We're not really asking you um, and trying to ingratiate themselves or pay them off or win them over. And the community has to really strongly say no um, and usually not be heard. Instead, what if we had a planning framework that gave the community a forum to gather on a regular basis and say, what do we want? What do we want to invite? What, what do we actively want to use our amenities on our land for? And if it's nothing, thanks, we're fine. We know what we're doing. We're already self-determining, so leave us alone. Then great. And, and, and they don't get approached by a mining company. Um, trying to divide them or win them over. Um, but that kind of policy would rest on completely different assumptions from the ones we work with now. It rests on the assumptions that, like Richard was saying, that people's knowledge 
is valuable that they already know what they need and what the land represents for them and what um what they value they don't need to have somebody come in and chain like try and convince them that they should value something else or that they should accept money for giving away this um autonomy um so yeah i think it's a hard question to answer in it like to answer it to explore it meaningfully in a way that would actually change anything we also have to think about like what is the kind of um paradigm shift the attitudinal shift that that we need to make um to make policies like that actually possible um i'd love to know if anybody knows anywhere in the world where people are trying out an approach like that that's different that's the other way around hey isabel hey everyone can you hear me is it good because i'm using my my 3g so probably won't be very good but well what you just mentioned is about so so interesting about this paradigm shift i recently i i mean i'm from london mining network too i'm from the brazilian working group and currently i've been quite uh away from from the network because i'm very deep in my dissertation that's why i've been quite academic in the chat like putting some concepts and things like this because i've been very deep into it and about the paradigm shift, something that I've been discussing, and I'm talking a lot about policy changes, and I'm, uh, in my dissertation, I'm writing about cosmopolitics, but we can talk about it later, so it's more relating to different cosmologies and policies. But there is a, an indigenous activist, his name is Ayuton Krenak, and I had the pleasure to have um, a forum session with him recently. And he, he literally said that the paradigm shift that we have to follow is to change the idea of development so the idea of development itself it's it's the whole uh discourse that has been framed since the colonial period and has been shifted from this idea of um mission civilizatrix so we're gonna be a civilized nation or we're gonna uh impose civilization by religion and other practice and usually violent practice taking their lands and what uh, this this indigenous leader can be mentioning like the capitalism has been getting more uh, financial um, artificial intelligence so there is always a discourse that we need to do this and that and we need these resources we need to keep digging and destroying people's land because in the name of development so that some countries can can be developed and we can help them afterwards because we will have a lot of money to to uh international aid or development policies and things like this so, so basically like there is a lot of, that is being discussed about it and uh, spe specifically about the this idea of that development itself is the paradigm that we are living today and this is the, like the, the biggest struggle that people on their lands are facing, especially related to mining, because this is what especially the Brazilian presidents have been saying, right? So it's, it's quite difficult to deal with this. But yeah, I think that these are the thoughts that I wanted. Gabriella, you're coming and going, unfortunately. Uh, could I just say something, Alec, about the role of policy? Oh, yes, go ahead, sorry. What it is, is that we can see all the problems of, uh, of mining industry, and, and we talk about an alternative paradigm or an alternative vision or whatever. And that's why I think we need to do more than we need to say more than what's wrong. We need to be able to have this alternative vision that can win people over. But part of sometimes the vision, you can have the vision and people say, yeah, we agree with your vision, but it's utopia. And I suppose the idea of have, trying to have some policies that maybe you could begin to mobilize around so that 
people could begin to see, oh, well, we could change that. And then if, if you manage to change something, it sort of inspires you to change a bit more. But it's very hard to say, well, this is what we've got at the moment. This is our vision. And somehow you've got to build a movement that's going to get to that vision. And I suppose when we say policy, we think of, well, what are some kind of ideas? Because in Scotland, that's what they did with their Land Reform Act, is they, they had a few things, for example, like community ownership, that they put forward. And they have managed to actually change the narrative about land ownership, because now it's much more about land should be used for the common good. The whole idea of using land for the common good has become part of the narrative in Scotland much more than it ever had been, and certainly isn't in this country. So that's what we're we're saying is that we want a vision, we want to say an alternative, but we want what are the steps, what are the different things we could do that might help build a movement to actually achieve an alternative vision. Great, thanks, Bodhi. Um, Richard, I see your hand up. Did you have a comment you want to make about that? Yes, uh, though I think Izzy will have much more sensible things to say. I think one of the, the problems for our work historically has been most of us in London Mining Network have been working in, with indigenous peoples around the world, not only in the global south, uh, because also in, in North America and Russia. But um, there was a long, long struggle by Indigenous peoples to get recognition of their rights over their own land. And that w came to fruition in the, I think it was 2007 UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which includes in it the right of Indigenous peoples to free prior informed consent over development decisions on their land. So that's now part of international soft law and increasingly hard law as countries that are signatories to, to UNDRIP uh, in, include it in their national legislation. Though there's a continuing struggle for it to be implemented properly because uh, usually only lip service is paid to it. But at least it's been asserted that, indigenous, that people who are recognised and self-recognised as indigenous peoples have rights over their own territory. Now, the, the further work that I mentioned in the chat a while ago, and which um, I think both Seb and um, Hal were talking about, about right to say no, this is based on the experience of customary communities in Southern Africa who don't speak of themselves or get spoken about, spoken about as indigenous peoples, but they are land-based and land-dependent peoples, and they are seeking to expand the, the notion of rights over land beyond people who, who are covered by UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So, these are really, really important rights and progress is being made towards the assertion of them. But I don't know how useful they are in England, where although many of us do feel very deeply about land, it's our relationship with it has not historically for quite a long time been quite the same as that of ind land based indigenous peoples and customary communities in other parts of the world and where even if we feel as I do extremely connected to particular bits of land in the area we grew up our ancestors were brutally kicked off it by enclosure or other things hundreds of years ago through the the um well by the ruling class nicking it basically uh, Karima's brother told me a marvellous story about the allotments where he worked in East Oxford, where those allotments came about by a, a grassroots struggle from people who had been kicked off land that they and their ancestors had, had used for centuries by Oxford colleges. And there was a standoff with police. And finally, the, the um, compromise was that land was bought for allotments, which still exist. But um, maybe Izzy can say uh, something what you spoke earlier, Izzy, about the, the close sorry. relationship <laughs> uh, uh, of people in County Durham with the land that they're trying to defend. But 
I don't know whether you and colleagues at Coal Action Network have done any particular thinking about how rights that have been asserted for indigenous peoples and are becoming asserted for customary communities might have any relevance to England or whether there's any kind of um, local alternative to these that we could try to assert. Um, hmm. No, I mean, I think the, like, I sort of trying to go back to Bonnie's question of, um, like, how do we get to this, how do we get to this paradigm, you know, this, this shift that we would need in order to have actually all meaningful policies, which, you know, I, I think links with what you're saying about, um, yeah, about the, like, active consent, um, is, like, as I mean, as a really small organisation, we face that dilemma of having to kind of, um, I think, as Hal was describing, like working with the immediate threat in front of us of this application for a, a new mine or something, but also knowing that there's this broad shift that needs to take place um, in order for the work to ha have long term impact and meaning. And, and, um, and the way we attempt to address that is through the way in which we work. So we attempt to prefigure a different paradigm through the way in which we work with communities. Um, as I know that many other um, groups who practice solidarity work do and are constantly learning. And so um, we, um, we try not to be like the mining company, basically. We don't go into a community and say a campaign is happening to you. Um, do you want to be involved in it or not? Uh, it's going to happen this way. Is that are you going to do it with us? We'll 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 find we'll go into the community and say, hey, um, we've heard about this thing. Uh, you probably know more about it than us. Um, why don't you tell us um, what you might need, if anything? And um, and and we go from there. And I'm sure that a lot of people here also work in similar ways and have many years of wisdom around ways of doing that but I think we shouldn't forget that that's that's part of prefiguring an alternative because um it's not only that you know it's it's um we, we find it an effective way to work it's that it achieves something more than just addressing that application we find that communities move on from that experience with more dignity and more um, certainty about their rights um, and about their ability to articulate themselves and be listened to um, and of their stories and their knowledge having value um, and I think that as we work with one another we can reinforce those notions that actually we can say an active yes and an active no to something we can um, we can be self-determining in in our communities and in our actions um, and and not have to be constantly in relation to the um, the dominant actors like the mining companies um, so that's it's not the whole answer but as kind of those of us who feel like a little overwhelmed by the question of how do we create a huge paradigm shift that we need um uh the way the way i we try and address that is is through not necessarily the campaigns that we run and the things that we say but how we do our day-to-day -day activities um yeah, i don't know if that was helpful great thank you um i'm aware we've only got eight minutes left so I don't know if we want to move into final comments. Karima, I remember you said you wanted to make some comments towards the end. Oh, uh, no, I was just going to carry on with this. Um, this I wanted to say a couple of things. Um, I, I think that um, a while back when uh, uh, we had a, a group called Decolonizing Environmentalism, who are still around, and one of the points they always made was um, about the importance of indigenous people's voices and people from the global south's voices being at the center of the struggles and i think that so rather than thinking of a world view which sees the earth as a living thing 
and which has campaigned in New Zealand and successfully campaigned for a river to be recognized as a person, we shouldn't see these things as marginal, but we should see them as central to the survival of all of us. Their leadership is what we actually need right now and what we can learn from them is the, probably the most important thing. But then that is the paradigm shift. We actually need to go to something that already exists. It isn't new. It's been there for a long, long time. Some people have chosen, unfortunately, to destroy that with huge violence, but we can learn from it still. Um, and there are indigenous people all, all over the world who are providing leadership in this, and that's perhaps something we should be listening to. Um, I, I believe that it's not just a, a, a river, for example, but actually also a forest and a mountain that are in the process of being recognized as people in New Zealand. Then there's also the idea of the crime of ecocide, um, you know, that you can actually cause so much destruction that no one can live there anymore. This is what climate change could bring to the 52 island nations around the world when the sea level rises, if we go above one and a half degrees. They are already taking, um, they are already taking this up in court. And um, so again, there is something to be learnt from this that people are asserting their rights in these ways and asking that the planet that we depend on and that gifts us everything we need to live be understood in a different way. Um, and I think that that's something, that's something that if we could just put that a little bit more into our thinking here, perhaps that would take us. I, I think it's really important for, for, um, um, for children, for example, in schools, their education, to have a better understanding of this worldview. Anyway, that's, yeah, that's, and I see Gabriella has added to that comment as well. Um, and it is, it's something that you find the world all over. Um, we've um, work, I've been doing a little bit of work with uh, uh, in indigenous people in India who also see everything in the forest as full of, uh, as, as a living thing. The forest is a living creature and everything in it has spirit. Um, so, so talking, to, uh, taking a mining company, taking that is actually killing that living thing. And I think that if we try to understand the world in this way, perhaps we'll have a, a, a different approach to it. Thank you, I'll stop. Great, thank you, Karima. Um, Leslie, did you want to say something? Yes, I did. I, amazing, I don't know how you knew that. Um, Thank you, Karima and, and Gabriella. Um, I totally agree with you. And in that spirit, I wonder if you might, after this meeting, carry on helping us to somehow write that into the people's land policy, which is, which is mainly UK focused. But it would be amazing to have some of the knowledge that you guys have learned or from your experience with indigenous people um, that we could place that in and 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 maybe of we should um I, I, in fact i i actually sort of think that's wrong to personify nature but that's another <laughs> that's another conversation but anyway i i understand the reason why that's done uh i think um but but to have some of that wisdom and and knowledge and um vision that if we could have that in people's land policy, that would be amazing. Would you would you carry on working with us? Oh, thank you. Oh yes, Bonnie. I see you. Sorry. Now that I don't usually get to talk, this is quite fun being able to say something. <laughs> um, yeah, because this links back to the our seminar last a uh, couple of weeks ago at the Joel Muir Trust. Because if we are going to change attitudes towards nature and the world there's a big struggle. I mean, I was a teacher for many years and did a lot of outdoor education and Duke of Edinburgh Award and um, in teaching in London. And it's very hard to get people to value nature um, and to think that it's, it's something, you know, what they value is their mobile phone. They value being able to go shopping at Primark or wherever. So we're actually are talking about, and that's when you talk about education, how do we actually change people's values towards you know the land to the environment and uh, the guy from the john muir trust was 
you know, talked about some of their projects. That that's what exactly what they're trying to do with the people that they work with. And they also have something called the John Muir Award, where they've done that, which is, you know, young people are, you know, learn, do conservation work, they do community work. And uh, that's one of their central planks is that they, it's the importance of making young people appreciate, you know, the actual nature. But so I think that's why we could learn from that. But I think the people of Britain are well behind because uh, and, and in this pandemic, I have friends up in the Highlands and people have just come up from England and the central belt of Scotland up to the Highlands and completely trashed it over the last month. They've been let loose and uh, they just didn't seem to understand. Here they were by some pristine lock. And my friends have just seen in the Cairngorms, you know, tents just abandoned and rubbish everywhere. And you're thinking, we have, a, I really agree that this is the kind of thing that we need to do. But I think it is a big uphill hill struggle. But that's what was so good to see that the John Muir Trust was really trying to do that sort of thing. And the whole education of young people, I think, is crucial. Great. Thanks, Bonnie. Um... I see we're approaching nine o'clock, so I don't know if now's a good time to begin to draw this to a close. Yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for your wonderful questions and for the speakers. Thank you, Isabel. I think you're the last speaker remaining. And Karima, for your help in organising this event. Um, Bonnie, did you have any final comments you wanted to talk about the next steps? Or? Um, shall I just sort oh, sorry, of... sorry, David. Yeah. Lee, uh, you, you've uh, both... Um, Two of you have already done very much of the job which was handed to me uh, this morning to wind up. Uh, and I, I'm certainly not going to try and summarise the amount of detail here. I just want to repeat the thanks. I've certainly learned uh, a lot more. And can I just leave you with this concept of agnesis, uh, A-G-N-E-S-I, which is short for as good as, it, as if it didn't exist. Like if you tidy up you'll find you've got multiple sets of things you uh, uh, don't need or have got too much about. Of. But it also applies to ideas and thoughts. And psychologically, we forget 80% of what we're exposed to in a lesson in about 24 hours. So notes are going to be made um, by Bonnie. Please send more into her any points. Please continue. If we, I'm very much aware if we don't continue to work on this, people like me will forget about it until they are next nudged in, you know, 18 months time. So please do look at Bonnie's uh, notes of it. Please talk to more people about it. I know most of you do that and you just simply can't do that too much. So massive appreciation for sort of staying the length, everybody who contributed. And remember, uh, there is the People's Land Policy, policy document and website and blog which I think I'll leave Bonnie to sort of uh, re sort of remind you where to go to find the link. But if we don't all do something uh, more than we would have done anyway within the next uh, 48 hours, let's say, I think what your next extra thing will be in the next 48 hours, then I'll think about mine and uh, see you all before too long. Uh, action leads to action, it leads to change, which is usually a good thing. Okay, thanks everybody. But so what my job is now is I have a recording while well, we're still recording. Um, so I'm really pleased that we have a record of all of this because it, I just thought it was so good, all the discussions and the speakers. And, and there's no way one could take notes from that. I mean, we've now got the record as long as I don't lose it somewhere. Um, I'll also be emailing. I mean, there was a lot of good resources in the chat which we'll also have preserved. So it's also something that I can email people. And uh, so, and also I'll probably email everyone who said they were gonna come. We had over 50 people signed up, but I can send them the link to this video. I can send them the link to all the chat resources. And uh, also if people do wanna be added to our contact list, then you know, they'll, I'll, show, I'll, I'll provide the, the information for that as well. So I'm now going to stop the recording and say goodbye to Expanded everybody. rehearsal. You've all got to think about this before you go to bed.